I think in this century, we'll probably pick up signals. Signals from an extraterrestrial civilization. Far flung from the Earth, hundreds of billions of miles away in all directions, lies a wall of fire surrounding our solar system. It is unlike anything any human has ever seen before. With a temperature reaching up to 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it is hotter than anything on Earth. And whereas scientists have prided themselves on being prepared for whatever they might face in the skies, nothing could have prepared them for this shocking phenomenon. Today, scientists everywhere are scurrying around to better understand what the wall of fire is and to identify how it can affect human life on Earth. Why is there a wall of fire around our solar system? How did it get there? And what are the potential effects on our existence? Join us in this video as we look into something strange that is happening to our solar system and its possible threat to our entire existence. As you're watching this video right now, there are two spacecraft journeying their way through space at more than 30,000 miles per hour, traveling farther from Earth than any other man-made object. Launched in 1977 from Cape Canaveral, Florida, in the United States, these two spacecraft have traveled billions of miles away from the Earth. On August 25, 2012, one of them crossed into interstellar space, making it the first spacecraft to leave our solar system. While they have been extremely useful to scientists in sending back data to Earth about space and teaching us more about our solar system, this wasn't their initial mission. Voyager 1 and 2, as these spacecraft are called, were built and designed to fly past the outer planets of our solar system. These planets are Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. This was the first time humans would be able to get up close to these planets for observation. They were to study them closely and retrieve vital information. And they have succeeded remarkably. It was only after they had completed this primary mission that they were able to lead the charge for humans' interstellar space exploration. To fully understand what our solar system looks like and the threat it might be facing, we first have to look at the Voyager mission and its two spacecraft. In the 1970s, the United States Space Exploration Team was in a kind of limbo. While the Apollo program was a success, it was also coming to a close. At the same time, NASA was trying to figure out what the future of manned spaceflight would look like. Other missions, like the Mariner, have also been successful in helping us expand what we know about the inner planets, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. The use of space probes to fly past and sometimes orbit these planets has been vastly beneficial. Since we had a bit of information about the inner planets, there were plans, however tentative, to embark on a further space exploration trip. This time, the focus would be on some of the outer planets. Around the same time, scientists were making important advances in gravity-assisted orbital trajectories. They had been exploring the possibility of using the gravity of a celestial body, in our case, a planet, to boost the velocity of a spacecraft. This, however, would only work as long as the spacecraft follows the proper orbit. In this sense, the heavier a planet is, the stronger the gravitational force that it exerts on nearby bodies. This would result in a bigger boost for any spacecraft, this means that once a space probe reaches Jupiter, which is the biggest and heaviest planet in our solar system, it could use Jupiter's force of gravity like a catapult to shoot out with force to go deeper into exploring space. The Voyager program was launched on this basic idea to further our understanding of the solar system and space in general. The program consists of two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. In actuality, Voyager 2 was launched first, about two weeks before Voyager 1. Voyager 2 was launched on August 20, 1977 aboard a Titan Centaur rocket, while Voyager 1 was launched on September 5, 1977. The reversal in numbering came into being because Voyager 1 passed by Voyager 2 after being put on a faster trajectory. As a result, Voyager 1, although launched later, reached Jupiter and sent back data first, leading NASA to change the numbering system. Voyager 1, having overtaken Voyager 2 en route, reached Jupiter in 1979 and Saturn in 1980. Voyager 2, on the other hand, went past Jupiter in 1979, Saturn in 1981, Uranus in 1985, and Neptune in 1989. It is the only spacecraft to date to have visited any of Uranus or Neptune and has been the source of the bulk of the information that scientists have about them. 
From a design perspective, the two spacecraft are similar, with zero detail to any aerodynamic requirements. This is because there is no aerodynamic friction in space to worry about, unlike our airplanes and cars. Both Voyager spacecraft weigh about 1,592 pounds and consist of a main bus, a high-gain antenna, three booms that hold scientific instruments, and two other antennae. The main bus makes up the body of the Voyager. It is shaped like a bus that has 10 sides, and it contains some electronics in a fuel tank for the 16 rocket thrusters. These thrusters are used to control the spacecraft's orientation as it moves around in space and to point their dish-like antennae back to Earth. While the thrusters run on hydrazine fuel, the electronic parts of each spacecraft are powered by thermoelectric generators that run on plutonium. On top of each main bus is a high-gain antenna that looks like a satellite dish and has a radius of 12 feet. This antenna is what the Voyagers use to receive commands and transmit data back to Earth. The Voyager's power supply is generated from the nuclear reactor in one of the booms, extending from the main bus. Due to the nature of the exploration, each Voyager uses a radioisotope thermoelectric power supply. This power is generated when plutonium dioxide releases heat as a result of natural decay. This heat is then converted into electricity by a series of thermocouples. While the power generated isn't that strong, it is enough to power the electronics and other scientific instruments on each spacecraft for a long time. Each spacecraft carries 11 scientific instruments, with about half of them shut off already since they were designed just to observe planets. The 11 instruments include a magnetometer, a cosmic ray detector, a plasma detector, a photopolarimeter, and an infrared interferometer. Others are a spectrometer, a radiometer, an ultraviolet spectrometer, a low-energy charged particle detector, a plasma wave detector, and cameras. Out of these 11, only five are currently working in Voyager 2. These five are the magnetometer, the spectrometer, the low-energy charged particle detector, the cosmic ray detector, and the plasma wave detector. Voyager 1 only has four of these functioning, as its plasma spectrometer is broken. As these spacecraft traveled in their space exploration tour, they took tens of thousands of images and data that have immensely affected our understanding of the solar system and its planetary bodies. According to estimates, by 1989, 12 years after both spacecraft were launched, enough data had been collected to fill 6,000 editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Voyager mission has also been successful in influencing public perceptions of the solar system, as it has laid the groundwork for modern space programs. The images taken of planets and their moons have also fueled excitement among the populace for future space exploration, unlike anything else before. From the two Voyager spacecraft, we learned more about the weather and atmospheric conditions on Jupiter. We also have been able to closely observe Jupiter's moons and discover volcanoes on Io. We also have been able to determine Ganymede as the largest moon in our solar system and discover Saturn's three new moons. Apart from this, we have also found out that Titan might have liquid hydrocarbons on its surface. So, where are these spacecrafts today? After exploring the planets in our solar system, the two Voyagers are on their way into interstellar space. While Voyager 1 is moving north, relative to the orientation of Earth out of the solar system, Voyager 2 is moving south. In 2007, NASA reported that both Voyager spacecraft had entered the helio sheath, which is the outermost section of the solar system. Here, the solar wind slows abruptly, becoming denser and hotter as it meets interstellar magnetic fields. As a result, a shock wave is formed due to the solar wind piling up as it is pressed against the approaching wind in interstellar space. This shock wave was traversed by the Voyagers, sending back data and giving astronomers their first idea of the shape and location of the helio sheath. Officially, Voyager 1 left the solar system and entered interstellar space in August 2012. And in 2018, Voyager 2 joined it. Since then, they've been passing through the heliopause, where they've discovered a wall of interstellar plasma. The exits of these spacecraft into interstellar space have been important in helping astronomers to accurately determine where exactly the edge of interstellar space is. This has erstwhile been difficult to measure, given that we live within the solar system. But with probes outside of our solar system, we can now have accurate measurements. These exits show that interstellar space begins just about 11 billion miles from the Sun. Interstellar space starts from the heliopause. 
the heliopause is the boundary between solar wind and interstellar wind, where the pressure of the two winds is balanced out, causing the solar wind to turn back and flow down the tail of the heliosphere. The solar wind refers to a flow of charged particles released by the sun. Where the wind is weakest and cannot push against the interstellar medium is the heliopause. And it is right here, in 2018, that the probes discovered something like a shield of fire gas made of solar wind with a temperature of about 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is unlike anything any human can imagine. To understand this wall of fire, as some have called it, we would need to understand the shape and structure of our solar system. The solar system is defined as the region where the influence of our sun is felt. This would include all our eight planets and their many moons. At the end of this influence, what we call our solar system is the heliopause. The heliopause is the boundary between our solar system and interstellar space. Think of it as a dense patch of forest acting as the border between two countries. This is what the heliopause is to our solar system. Interstellar space is the space between the stars in a galaxy and it is as cold as cold can get. According to reports, the temperature is about 3 kelvins. Although it is officially recognized as a space, it is not in any way empty. It contains large amounts of neutrinos, charged particles, atoms, molecules, dark matter, and photons, ranging from the highest energy radiation to the sluggish light of the cosmic microwave background, CMB. According to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, the average distance between stars in the Milky Way galaxy is about five light years. A light year is the measurement of the distance a beam of light travels in a single Earth year, which is approximately six trillion miles. In simpler terms, a light year is the distance light will travel in 12 months. Why do scientists use light years and not the regular standards of measuring distance? On a large scale, like that of the universe, measuring distances in miles would be cumbersome given that the extremely large numbers are being discussed. Thus, it is much simpler for astronomers to measure the distances of stars and other celestial bodies from us in the time it takes for light to travel that distance. The constituents of interstellar space are rather sparsely spread out, with more bunched up near the center of the galaxy than in the outskirts where the Sun and Earth are located. These constituents are sometimes referred to as the interstellar medium, or ISM for short. According to scientists at the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center IPAC, at Caltech, the ISM is composed of hydrogen, which is approximately 90%, and helium, which is approximately 8%. The remaining 2% of the ISM is made up of other trace elements and molecules that are heavier than hydrogen and helium and have all originated from the deaths of stars. They are sometimes called space sands. For hundreds of years, the question of what interstellar space was didn't rise among scientists. This was because the geocentric and heliocentric models of the universe didn't have a place for it. In these models, our sun was king and our solar system was the only one. But as we grew in our knowledge of the universe beyond our backyard, we realized the importance of heliopause as it was the boundary between our solar system and the billions of other galaxies in the universe. The heliopause is a theoretical boundary where the strength of the sun's solar wind is not strong enough to counter the stellar winds of the surrounding stars. The solar wind is a thin stream of electrically charged gas. It is the point where the influence of our solar system balances against that of the interstellar medium along the edge of the heliosphere. The heliosphere is a bubble created by the clouds of interstellar gas that surrounds our solar system. As the solar wind emanating from the sun blows, it creates a bubble that extends far beyond the orbits of the planets. This bubble is shaped like a long windsock as it moves in sync with the sun through interstellar space. According to Richard Marsden, a Ulysses Project scientist at the European Space Agency's Technical Center, ESTEC in the Netherlands, the heliosphere is the bubble this solar wind blows out into the local interstellar medium. It defines the volume of space over which our sun's influence predominates. The heliosphere is a massive bubble extending far behind the orbit of Pluto, as much as three times the distance before coming in contact with the interstellar medium. This giant bubble is responsible for protecting the entire solar system from the interstellar wind, just as our planet's magnetic field protects it from the devastating influence of the solar wind. Arik Posner, a heliophysicist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., says, The effect the heliosphere has on cosmic rays allows for human exploration missions with longer duration. 
in a way it allows humans to reach Mars. The challenge for us is to better understand the interaction of cosmic rays with the heliosphere and its boundaries. As we move further out into the heliosphere and away from our solar system, what we notice is that the solar wind comes into contact with the interstellar wind. A couple of things are noticeable here. The first is that the solar wind begins to slow down to subsonic speeds and heats up due to the pressure from the interstellar winds. This region is called the termination shock. Here, the solar winds blowing billions of miles away from the sun and traveling at an average speed of 195 to 415 miles per second experience an abrupt drop in their speed and an increase in their temperature. This is where the end of the heliosphere begins. Here, the highly charged particles of the solar wind are compressed together to form what is known as the heliosheath. The heliosheath is a region of space where the solar winds and the interstellar winds interact, but where the influence of the solar wind is still stronger than that of the interstellar winds. The difference in the influence between the two gradually shrinks the further away from the sun you get, and the heliopause is the point where the interstellar wind starts to overpower the solar wind. As we move further to the end of our solar system, we'd see the heliopause. This is where the phenomenon known as the wall of fire is found. At the heliopause, the differences in pressure and speed between the solar winds and the interstellar winds cause a redirection of the solar winds in the opposite direction. Think of it as a ship sailing through the sea. As it progresses, the waves of the ocean push back against the displaced water ahead of the ship, traveling at speed. Here, a new wave is created, curving around the shape of the ship and opposite it. Similarly, the solar wind pushes through the interstellar medium in an outward direction from the sun. But at the heliopause, the interstellar winds prove stronger, and this pushes the solar winds backward but around the sun. This creates a world that seems to follow after the sun in an orbit, forming a wall of extremely hot gases, with temperature reaching 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit. According to the European Space Agency, the shape of the heliosphere is not symmetrical around the Sun. The motion of the Sun through the local interstellar medium compresses the heliosphere at the front and drags it out into a tail at the back, very much like a planetary magnetosphere. While this discovery has stoked the fires of debates between quantum mechanics and general relativity, it is still largely unknown to the general public that our solar system is surrounded by a massive wall of interstellar plasma with a temperature of 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit is a fact that many people have no idea of or are willing to think about. This wall blocks out 70% of cosmic rays from interstellar space, keeping our solar system from such radiation. Outside of this wall is a spike in the level of cosmic radiation that would have had devastating effects on our planet. It is currently unclear what effects this wall of fire will have on NASA's proposed plans for interstellar travels. But given that the region is one of low density that could allow both Voyager spacecraft to pass through unscathed future interstellar ships might not be too negatively affected. Still, it is currently unknown what the effect of the plasma wall will be on biological beings. While we battle to determine what the wall of fire is and its consequences, however positive or negative, on our solar system and biology, the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft continue their journey into space. And contained in both spacecraft are golden records, gold-plated copper disks containing audio messages and images from Earth for any aliens that might come in contact with the spacecraft. We might just get a phone call from out of space, far beyond an 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit wall of fire, one of those days. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space. Videos about space.